kitchen tent, individual tents. We like to pitch at the base of small snow fields because you can drink the water right out of them. It's really wonderful stuff. And what we do is, in the course of each day, is we, these are Devonian exposures. So we just walk back and forth over these things, looking, where looking to find where bones are weathering out. Okay, and when we find a place where bones are weathering out, we dig in. Problem is, we, we had none of that in 1999. We didn't find any bones. Um, <laughs> it was a complete failure uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is we were in the middle of the ancient Devonian Ocean. Should have read the paperwork carefully. Uh, and it would, actually, that's not true. We, uh, it was actually, we went to a place where we thought it was actually a delta system, but uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was not mapped uh, correctly. And then the other issue was the um, uh, weather. We had two weeks of bad weather. And so, you know, uh, the truck, 1999, up to experience. So we decided, since we're in the ocean in the west, let's move further east, upstream, if you will. That's what this map would show you. Uh, so we're further east. Now we're making it to Ellesmere Island uh, out here. This is what those areas look like. Um, and we're working these hills. These actually, at least you can climb. They look really steep. They're not that horrible. Um, they're not that horrible to, to meander. So you go up and down these things. And, we, and as we moved east, we started to find fossil fish. Okay, so as we went upstream, if you will, we started to get low finned fish, which is exactly what we were, we were looking for. And this is kind of where the sites are that we've been working in the last few years. This is what it looks like. Again, here's camp for scale. And these are sort of the layout of the rocks we really love. Because, you know, you can see the layers here, right? And so we just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all day until we find the fossil. <coughs> now, the big discovery uh, happened, it started with a young man, an undergraduate, who joined us on our crew. Um, he's a Penn undergraduate by the name of Jason Downs. This is Jason right here. <laughs> um, there's a reason why this picture's there. Uh, Jason discovered the site that ultimately, ultimately allowed us to find uh, uh, the creature, which I'll talk about in a second. This is two hours before Jason discovered the site, showing the site itself before Jason walked on it. Jason just finished lunch, okay? He was getting up to walk around. This picture was taken just to show the vista. In about two hours' time, Jason was going to walk right here. You read sir, it's gray layer, is that gray? All that? You know why it's gray? It's a mat of fossil bones. It's a mat of fossil fish bones. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, all of us go back to the camp, and we're sitting having, you know, beginning to make preparations for dinner, and there's no Jason. He did not return. That's kind of scary, because in the Arctic, we like to go out in teams, and, you know, we were worried about Jason. Uh, and then I heard rustling, and Jason came ripping in the tent, he sees his eyes like, like orbs. And, and I was thinking maybe he was chased by a polar bear or something like that. Um, <laughs> But it turns out that Jason's every pocket of his body was loaded with fossil bones. And he pulls, and he's like pulling bone after bone out of his pockets, laying on the table. And Jason comes out, and he pulls out like a, a, uh, a digital camera, showing us the screen on the camera, showing us all the bones. And we're shaking too much, you can't see any, any images. But anyway, it's daylight 24 hours a day in the Arctic, so we, dinner can wait, okay? We grab candy bars, and this is us that evening. We walked about a mile to Jason's site. These are some of the a handful of the bones that Jason discovered. These are like little lungfish plates and things like that. And <coughs> this is the end of the season. And we literally crawled this rock, uh, Jason's spot, to try to find the layer that Jason's bones were coming out of. Okay? Again, we failed miserably. We could not find this layer. You'd think it would be easy, but it was actually really hard. So we left the season not finding Jason's layer. Um, the challenge is this. You can see how everything's sort of broken up here. You see how these little channels in here? What happens is in the Arctic, it gets really, really cold in the, in, in the winter. And in the summer, it gets less really, really cold. So it goes from really, really cold to less really, really cold and so forth. And that causes this expansion and contraction of the rock, which breaks everything up. And so it, made, it, it creates this rind on top where we couldn't really identify the layer easily. So we went back the next year to try to find the layer. And bingo, we did. This is Ted my colleague, who's my partner in all this. Uh, we eventually found the layer, and here's the layer. You can see it laid out here. It's, uh, it's about 15 feet long. And as we exposed the layer, we started to find skeleton after skeleton of fossil fish, one on top of the other, beautifully preserved, three-dimensional. And so we worked this site in 2002. Uh, but again, uh, we hit a wall. Every one of those skeletons of fossil fish we were finding was known somewhere else. Nothing was new. Um, so we left the season in 2002, really kind of discouraged, actually, um, that uh, we weren't really finding anything new, and uh, we were running out of money. <laughs> so, uh, but one of the blocks we brought back in 2002, we started to work, work on the lab, and it was, it, it was a teaser. What was this? You can see here, it's a snout fragment, um, you know, about yay long, and it looked for all the world like it was a flat-headed animal. 
And that got our interest, because what it told us was perhaps there's a flat-headed animal in there. So that was just enough to allow us to raise just enough money to get back for one last trip in 2004. So we went back in 2004, and one of the, no, the most remarkable moment in the field for me happened in July 2004, in the fifth day of the field season. My, my colleague, Steve Gatesy, this is the site here, by the way, we opened the book. This is, so this is what the site looks like. Camp is usually around the bend here, about a mile. Um, this is the site. We have dug a very big hole. Steve, who's here, the first day of the, uh, I'm sorry, the fifth day of the season, was picking rocks right here. And you can see the rocks here. And what he did is he picked a piece of rock here, and this is bone. You see this bone here? It looks the same color as the rock, but it has a different shape. Okay, and there's one bone that goes here embedded in the rock, and there's another bone that goes here embedded in the rock. What it was, was the snout of a fish. And not just any fish, it was the snout of a flat-headed fish. Okay? That was beautiful. That was exactly what we were looking for. Remember I said that flat-headedness is one of those features for, you know, that we're looking for? No, yeah, it's a snout of an animal sticking out of the cliff. Which meant if we had any luck whatsoever, the rest of the skeleton would be uh, nestled in the rest of the cliff. So what Steve did, and you can see this about three weeks after his discovery, he roughed this whole thing out. You see, he roughed it out like a pedestal. And that's essentially what we brought home, wrapped in plaster. But as we did that, I was working two slots down. I found another one of these things, a flat-headed fish a skeleton. And Farish Jenkins here, who was working with us from Harvard, um, us, um, see if I can, okay, Farish Jenkins here found yet another one. So by the end of the season, we had three, possibly four, skeletons of this flat-headed fish. Now our challenge came, let's get these things home. The weather was not very good, not very cooperative to the drying of our plaster, which we entombed these things in. So we set up a little kiln, a quick stove, a little kiln. The challenge here is getting them home in the bottom of a helicopter. You know, they, that roughs things up pretty good. That's the first year graduate student gets that job. I'm too old for that one, sorry. Um, but anyway, then we brought these things home, and then the next remarkable phase happened. Okay. Um, they went to the hands of the preparators. The plaster jackets were open. And the preparators, wonderful technicians, Fred Mollison in Philadelphia, Bob Masick in Chicago, worked months on these things with needles and pins underneath the microscope, removing the rock grain by grain. This is what Fred did. This is Steve's specimen. There's the needle he works with. He's removing these rocks grain by grain. Look at this. All of a sudden, after about a month, he exposed, exposed his plate of bone. Look at that. There's one hole where an eye is. Here's a hole where another hole where an eye is. Three months go by. Boom. Look what we start to come out. What starts coming out here. There's an orbit, another orbit. These is where the eyes are. This is a skull of a flat-headed animal. Now look, we're beginning to see parts of the skeleton back here. Let's just take Fred's specimen. Here's a fish with a conical head. These things have scales and fins with fin webbing. Here's an early land-living creature with a flat head with eyes on top. They have necks and limbs. Here is the a new fish. It has scales on its back and fin webbing. Yet, like the amphibians I showed you, it had a flat head with eyes on top. It has a neck where the head's separate from the, from the shoulder. And indeed, when we cracked open the fin, remember we had numerous specimens, so we decided to take one of them apart. Um, when we cracked open the fin, what did we find? It has bones that correspond to our upper arm, forearm, even parts of our wrist and palm. Shoulder, elbow, even parts of the wrist. Truly remarkable. I brought the cast of the head of this specimen right here. You can look at it after the talk. This is Steve's specimen. This is the specimen whose snout was sticking out of the cliff uh, that he roughed out. This gives you a sense of what other things were. Anyway, so the idea here is that this creature, at about 375 million years ago, here's a fish down here about 380, here's early tetrapods. Um, like a lobe fin fish, uh, it has fins, scales, and primitive jaws, which I didn't talk about. But like a land living animal, it has lots of things a neck, wrists, flat heads. Uh, it has portions of limb bones, a whole long list of, of features. So as the discoverers of this creature, we were given the privilege and joy of giving it a name. And that was sort of my job in this whole thing. So I, we wanted the name to reflect its Inuit uh, heritage. We worked there at the good graces of the Inuit people. Um, and uh, we wanted it to reflect the, its provenance. So we wanted a name that uh, we could reflect it. And this is the Committee of Elders of Nunavut. Um, and we wanted a name that reflected its provenance, but that we could also pronounce. And the name of this committee did not give us a whole lot of confidence to <laughs> uh, be able to pull this thing off. So I talked to this guy right here and, uh, to try to find a name, and, we're, and I was trying to describe the creature, and he wanted, he said, look, just describe it simply. What is it? I said, well, it's a large freshwater fish. He says, oh, you've got yourself a Tiktaala. I said, what's a Tiktaala? 
He says it's a large freshwater fish. <laughs> <laughs> he actually suggested another name as well, which we couldn't pronounce, which is a synonym for this. So Tiktaalik stuck. It's a great name. And so we started to take these Tiktaaliks apart in the laboratory. Keep in mind, all this is going on with a Dover trial that's going on in Pennsylvania, the Kitzmiller trial. Yeah. Oh. You know, people are talking about intelligent design, the fact that there are no transitional fossils in the fossil record. And I had Tiktaalik on my desk on this time. I couldn't tell anybody about it. It was, it was one of those moments. Anyway, so here's, here's the Chicago specimen. This is a, a, an underside of a skull. Here's one jaw, here's another. As we took this one apart, we started to find a shoulder and an upper arm bone. And so this one we really took apart. So there's the upper arm bone, that's the humerus <coughs> we took out. We took out every bone of the specimen, humerus, radius, and ulna, forearm bones, and, and wrist bones, and so forth. And at the time, in 2006, this is what we had of the fin. We had one bone, upper arm bone, we had a shoulder, we had an elbow, we had two forearm bones, and we even had a proximal carpal and distal carpal joints, that is, portions of the wrist, that were functional. Furthermore, we were able to take these things apart to look at the joint surfaces, okay? And so we could see the shape of the joint surfaces of the shoulder, of the elbow, of the wrist. When we did that, we saw that this animal was really primed to do a form of push-up that deflects its, its elbow and to have a palm that lies flush against the ground. It even has areas for an expanded pectoral muscle, musculature. So this is a fish that do a push-up with a fin in fin leather. So this was the reconstruction of the colic. Uh, well, here's the head spin clip. But anyway, so you have a flat head with eyes on top, a neck, shoulders, beautiful limb. Look at that, set up to do a push-up with even a palm area that can lie flush against the ground, and beautiful ribs that interdigitate one another. We didn't have the back end when we described this in 2006, but it turns out uh, uh, we went back in 2006, and we're going back this summer. Uh, we, have, we have more. We actually have up to the sort of uh, halfway through the tail. So we have a hind fin and other things, and the pelvis and so forth. So we did this reconstruction, but this thing really hit the news back in 2006 in a big way, largely because of the social context with intelligent design and creationism and so forth. So other people chimed in with a reconstruction. This is uh, Miss Philbin's third grade class in that chips for Vermont that did a, a lovely uh, reconstruction of Tiktaalik. Now, the, the, the important thing for the book, for Inner Fish, is that Tiktaalik and other creatures like it, indeed worms that people work on and, and jellyfish uh, and so forth, really are a piece of not just esoteric history, they're a piece of our own history. The story of Catholic, the story of the transition from life in water to life in land, is every bit of a piece of our own past as other transitions, like Lucy, uh, that you might have heard of. That is, we can follow the <coughs> transitions of the limb bones in a fish, like Tiktaalik, all the way to humans. When we deal with the origin of a wrist in a creature like Tiktaalik, we're dealing with the origin of something that became our own wrist. When we deal with the origin of a neck in a creature like Tiktaalik, we're dealing with something that ultimately became our own neck after, after uh, many hundreds of millions of years. This is a piece of our own past, and it's a piece of our own past we can see with beautiful fossil series. So understanding fish, worms, and other creatures really allows us to understand something about ourselves. And so let's just start with ourselves. Well, let's just start with Albert Einstein. If you're going to start, you might as well start at the top, right? <laughs> Albert Einstein um, was a uh, smart guy. He had a, a, an equation, E equals MC squared. I'm not as smart as Einstein, but I have an equation, and that is that Einstein equals some sort of fish. <laughs> or very derived, a fish that walks on two legs with big brains that can manipulate uh, his hands and so forth. It helps to compare Professor Einstein, ooh, we lost it, uh, Professor Einstein uh, to the fish. And obviously we can trace many of our structures, from the deep structures of our heads to the structures of our appendages uh, to Einstein, um, to, to, um, to fish. Like, for instance, bones of our arm can be traced to lobe fin fish like Tiktaalik, even beyond Tiktaalik, where creatures have uh, the individual um, um, uh, upper arm bone. Look at the head. If you look at, uh, say, a couple weeks after conception in a human, here's a head, what it, what it looks like. Here's the primordia of the eyes coming in. You have a series of swellings in the front end of the head. These swellings are separated from one another by a slit. Sharks and fish and turtles and other things have this as well. The head doesn't look identical, but they have these wonderful slits and arches. These are known as the gill arches. Let's follow these fates in development. In a fish, like a shark, you can follow the fates of these things. These are bags of cells, right, separated by a cleft. And you can follow what happens, or the fates of these cells in these bags. Uh, and you can find that they become portions of the upper jaw, and then they become, or, and lower jaw, and portions of the, uh, of the gill apparatus, the bones and muscles and nerves that support the gills. What happens in humans? Well, you can follow these things here, and they become portions of our jaw and ear bones. They become portions of the bones that support our throat, and they become portions of our own voice box. 
and indeed the nerves and muscles and arteries all follow this uh, peel arch plan as well. The take home message is the, the many of the structures I'm using to talk to you with right now and many of the structures you're using to hear me with right now correspond to the gill bones of fish. And we see that written in fossils, we see that story written in embryos, and we indeed we even see it in the portions of the DNA that drive this. It's a wonderful story, and it's a story that is linked by many different independent kinds of lines uh, of evidence. Finally, I just want to close with a little thing on uh, the testes. Um, <laughs> there's a reason why I'm doing this. <laughs> if you look at our bodies, I taught human anatomy for many years at the University of Chicago. If you look at our bodies, we're not very intelligently designed. That is, if you see loops, when you look at nerves and arteries and vessels in our bodies, they take weird courses. They don't go straight from point A to point B. They'll frequently go to point A, to point B, to point C, to point D, to point F, to point A prime, back to point A prime. They take these weird loops. A great case in that, and, in, and if you want to straighten out those loops, you have to understand history. Great case is uh, males. Here's the, uh, the testes. And the spermatic cord goes from the testes to the penis, but as it does so, it takes a loop the loop over the pelvis. That is really unfortunate for us males, for we males. The reason is because in that making that loop the loop, we have a weakness of the abdominal wall. That is, um, uh, we are susceptible to a particular kind of hernia because of the way this loop-the-loop -loop developed. Oops, and it developed because we started like an embryo of a shark. Sharks don't have that. Sharks have the gonad, the male gonad here, the testes, actually high up, much actually towards the chest. And they have a duct that goes towards the opening, the cloaca. Actually, it turns out we begin our development much like a shark embryo, and we gain our mammalness, the males, as the testes descends from this position to the, to the scrotum. Excuse me. Here's a human male developing. The testes begin high up towards the kidney, and over time, they descend until they go right into the scrotum. And that descent of the testes creates that loop-the-loop -loop of the spermatic uh, cord, which also makes the male uh, abdominal wall weaker than the corresponding part of the abdominal wall in females. And it's all because males have the need uh, for a scrotum, which controls uh, temperature uh, development in sperm. But that is a piece of our past. We begin our development much like <coughs> a fish begins its development with its testes uh, uh, undescended. This is a wonderful story, because the story of our body is the story of 3.5 billion years of history. And if you want to understand why we look the way we do today, Indeed, uh, if you want to understand uh, 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 how our body fails in certain predictable ways, our history is a big part of that story. Indeed, our history is a big part of our future. If, if, in judging by the Nobel Prizes in Medicine or Physiology of the last 13 years, I should have called this book your inner worm, your inner yeast, or your inner sea urchin. Because discoveries in these creatures are really have, may have vital importance to human health. Let's just take the Nobel Prizes in Medicine or Physiology of the last five years. Two of them have gone to five people working on a little tiny worm the size of a comma on a piece of paper that lives in the dirt. But that worm is producing discoveries which are telling us how our own genes can be turned on and off, which will provide insights that will cure many human diseases, undoubtedly. I can imagine no piece of, 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 of evidence of our deep connection to the rest of life on this planet than that, that, that particular Nobel Prize. Thank you very much. Thank you.